Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the first event of our new Think ND series, The Science and Business of Wine, Business Spirits, and Beer. We are excited to launch uh, this new community where we are going to have a series of talks over the next year or so covering themes such as the science and business of wine, um, wine behind the curtain. That's going to be uh, the subject of our discussion today. We'll also discuss the science and business of spirits, the science and business of beer, wines of the world, and the state of the industry. Uh, the, this will be a more discuss general discussion of wine, beer, and spirits. And in each of these uh, sets of talks, we're going to have uh, cover a variety of topics where you'll, you'll hear from a faculty here at Notre Dame, uh, also the Robert Mondavi Institute of Food and Beverage Science at UC Davis, and also from experts from each of these industries. Uh, we're excited to dive deep into these industries and share with you the science, engineering, technology, business, and craftsmanship that goes into each of these glasses of, of spirit, wine, or, or other tasty beverage. So before we get started, I, I need to thank the co-sponsors. At this time, um, I want to thank all of our collaborators uh, on this series, including uh, the Notre Dame College of Science, the Notre Dame Mendoza College of Business, the Robert Mondavi Institute for Food and Beverage Science at UC Davis, the Notre Dame Family Wines, and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. In addition, I need to thank our co-sponsors, um, who are the Notre Dame Young Alumni and the Notre Dame uh, Senior Alumni. Um, and then before we uh, dive in, we uh, there's an important part of this. We want you to be able to ask questions for us. And so there is a Google form that we're going to share with you now. And so please put your questions in there and, and you can put them in at any point in the discussion. So as a question comes up, go ahead and ask it. Um, that way we'll be able to have a good set of questions for the end and also allow us to facilitate the questions as effectively as possible. We're going to try to answer them as many as we can, given the time constraint. Okay, at this point, um, I'd like to introduce the session, um, and I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to dive into the basics of wine. The goal of our session today is to take some of the mystery away from wine, to, to pull back the curtain. So we're going to give you a basic introduction to what wine is, how to taste it, uh, what makes one wine different from another, and what sometimes makes good wine go bad. And then in the next three sessions of the series, you'll get a much more in-depth discussion of topics, including how grapes are grown for wine, how wine is made, and then um, more about the business side of the wine industry. And with this, um, I'd like to welcome my colleague and friend, Professor uh, Andy Waterhouse from the class of 1977. Um, he is also a professor and the faculty director of the Robert Mondavi Institute at UC Davis. Um, and we're really excited to have him here today to help us cover this, this topic. So um, Andy, before we get started, I wanted to thank you for sharing a few of the videos that we were able to post on ThinkND as primers and additional resources for today's talk and encourage everybody to go and, and check these out um, after the session. Um, so maybe uh, just to get started, the first thing we need to ask is, well, what exactly is wine and, and what is it made of? Well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> so what is wine? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, Legally, in the United States, if you sell something that's labeled wine, what it means is that it's the fermented product of grapes, okay? If you use any other fruit, you have to declare that it's, you know, something else, strawberry wine or elderberry wine or what have you, but wine is made by the fermentation of grapes. So maybe as a, as a foundation for the rest of our discussion, can you tell us briefly about some key aspects of how wine is made? Okay, well, <clears throat> the, as, as I mentioned, it's a, there's a fermentation process. So you would start with grapes and um, then uh, with the white wine, you would crush the fruit and then press it and get the juice. So the white wine is made solely with the juice. You then do a yeast fermentation with that. And so normally you would add yeast and this is very similar to the yeast you would use in uh, baking bread, in fact, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then that fermentation will take, um, depending on the temperature, anywhere from four days to maybe a couple of weeks if it's very cold, uh, it goes slower. And then after that um, fermentation, you sometimes, depending on if you want the, this flavor change, uh, you would do a, what's called a malolactic fermentation, which involves adding a bacteria Malactic bacteria. And that uh, 
engenders some additional changes and changes the flavor a bit. And so with some white wines, you want to encourage that and some you don't. Um, typically then after those fermentations are done, uh, you'll wait a few months at least before bottling a wine. And with the red wine, it's a little bit different. You crush the fruit up and then you ferment everything together. So the skins, the seeds are all in there. And that's very important because that's where the color comes from, it comes from the skin of the grapes. Most wine grapes have clear juice. Um, and then after the fermentation is done, you then press and remove the solids. Uh, usually with red wine, you would age it a little bit longer. So it would be typically a year or so before you finish aging it and bottle it and sell it. Uh, with white wine, you can usually get it on the shelf, say three months or so if you're in a hurry. Um, although with some white wines, you will barrel age it after the fermentation, or you might even ferment in a barrel, and then it would take six to eight months before it's ready to bottle. So that's a little nutshell there. Actually, can you just comment a little bit on where rosé, how would that fit into all of this? Uh, so rosé is um, essentially a white wine with a little bit of color. And the way it's made is you would take red grapes, you would crush them up, you put them in a tank and start the fermentation. And then you carefully watch the color. And when you get enough pink color out of the skins, you then press it. Uh, often that can be as little as one day or even a few hours that you would uh, leave it in what's called skin contact to extract a little bit of color out of their skins. Well, with that uh, kind of comment on color, maybe what we can do is get down to what many of the participants are really interested in, which is drinking wine. So when we taste wine, what should we be paying attention to? Well, there's a number of things. Um, <clears throat> when you taste uh, in a formal sense, the first thing you do is you pay attention to the color. So you get your glass there, Holly. Now there we go. <laughs> so um, now as a chemist, I've learned to swirl things uh, from a lot of experience in grad school doing reactions. So um, it, it may take a little practice before you can swirl like this and not splash the wine yep. out, but anyway, <laughs> you take the wine and you you look at it and see whether it's uh, what the color is. The color gives you a lot of clues. Um, with the white wine, uh, the amount of yellowing can tell you, say, how old it is. With the red wine, if it's bright uh, cherry red, it tells you it's fairly young. If it's a brick red, it tells you it's an older wine. And then <clears throat> um, usually you look to see whether it's cloudy or clear. With the white wine, you usually expect to see a clear wine, although these days natural winemakers seem to relish in making cloudy wine. Anyway, I'll skip that. Uh, and then um, after you, and now the swirling is not completely, is not just uh, an affectation of chemists. You actually are getting more aroma into the glass and then you smell it like this. Um, and, and so what you've done is you've, You've, you've moved some of the aroma molecules into the, what's called the headspace of the glass. And then you're breathing that aroma that's in the glass. That's why you always leave a uh, room in the top of the glass so you can get the, those aromas into that, that space, that air above the wine. And that's, then when you smell, you smell that, that, that aroma. Um, and after that, then you taste. And if if it's as a if I'm at a professional tasting, then you spit, but you don't have to do that today. Um, so <clears throat> now, what do you smell for? Um, usually, with uh, uh, modern wines today, what you're smelling for is a lot of fruitiness, or at least some fruitiness. So you're smelling um, fruity aromas, but that's, and, and you might smell, for instance, you might smell something that smells like citrus, like grapefruit or what have you. That's not because anyone has put grapefruit into the wine. It's the process of fermentation has generated molecules that remind us of various uh, fruity or various fruits. Okay, so we might smell berries, strawberries, blackberries, citrus, et cetera. And uh, the amount of that, it, well, it depends on, on your preference, whether you want a lot of fruity flavors or you want a little bit less. Um, and so more isn't always better. Um, 
And then if the wine was aged in a barrel, um, then you will pick up some sweet aromas from that. Um, they often smell like vanilla. Um, it's in some cases there is the vanillin, which is the chemical that we you know use as a flavorant for vanilla. Uh, sometimes that's actually present. Uh, sometimes it's not, but but there is this um, vanilla type aroma. In the winemaking, we call it oaky, but you know if you haven't smelled inside of a barrel, you might not know what that means. And then um, the uh, if you have a well aged wine, you'll have different aromas, um, and and some of those are don't have what you might consider to be positive descriptors, so like canned asparagus. But that is the hallmark of a well-aged, meaning multiple decade wine is it'll smell a little bit like canned asparagus. So um, anyway, then once you put it in your mouth, I'll, I'll do that. It's a little early in the morning here, but you know, this is work. Um, you then uh, get a lot of acidity in your mouth. So that's, an, a, again, a real important factor in the taste of wine is acidity. Um, if you didn't have acidity, you really wouldn't have wine at all. And then there's, of course, a little bit of, um, maybe if red wine, it's a little bit of tannin, which is astringency. It's not technically a taste, but it's a mouthfeel and, and so on. So maybe I better stop there. Um, don't want to go on too long. Actually, a, a couple of things that I will add here. You saw that I did spill my wine a little bit. Um, I wanted some color in the background. This is a bit more than I would normally put in if you're going to, but if you want to, uh, uh, if you put too much in, uh, putting it on the, the table can actually really help uh, to to swirl it um, and, and without spilling it. Actually, one of the panelists suggested that I uh, recommend that to everybody. It's something that I do just by habit, but I think it can be useful. Um, a second thing that is maybe useful when you're talking about the astringency and the tannins, many people have experienced uh, oversteeped black tea. Um, and so that's something that they'll be very familiar with to understand what a tannic wine is. You get the same feel like you would from um, oversteeped black tea. Yeah, you get sort of a drying sensation in the mouth, yes. So, so we can also maybe now talk a little bit about um, how those, uh, and you said this, but just to emphasize that all those aromas and those flavors that you just mentioned are coming really from two sources, the grapes and, and the fermentation, I guess, slash aging process. So as you mentioned, none of these flavors are being added uh, the way they might in, in beer. Like, you know, when people have orange peels in, in beer, they're really putting orange peels in the beer as it's being made. But here, right. like for the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, it's very, it, it might smell very citrusy, but that is just the grapes um, interacting with the, with the yeast. Um, yes. or, or like with a, a buttery Chardonnay, um, nobody put butter in it, right? That, in that case, it's the malolactic acid bacteria that are giving that, uh, giving that smell. Right. Um, and so uh, in terms of I guess maybe a good transition here is to talk a bit about the basic types of wine. Now that we've talked about sort of the fundamental flavors and aromas, how do these relate to the basic types of wine that people are familiar with? Well, um, a, a fermentation, as I described earlier, um, the end result of that is a dry wine, meaning that it doesn't have any sugar. So the fermentation, the yeast fermentation, the yeast convert. Um, the sugar to alcohol. Also, they do make carbon dioxide, which normally just evaporates. Um, and, but the yeast do other things, and that's why wine doesn't taste like grapes. There's a lot of other chemical transformations that occur um, during that fermentation process. So the yeast are making a bunch of things uh, from uh, chemicals that are found in the grapes, and that's what makes a lot of the fruity aroma. It's, it's kind of uh, funny uh, to me as a chemist that we talk about, you know, the fruity tastes of wine and really all, most of those arise from the fermentation process. <clears throat> and you mentioned the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc um, and that particular very potent, uh, I, you call it a citrus or grapefruit aroma is actually completely an artifact of the fermentation process. And my um, in my class on wine chemistry, I spend like half an hour explaining this to our, our wine winemaking students, but it's a it's sort of a historical artifact of, of a combination of factors that led to the production of this flavor 
uh, starting with the cool climate there. So the, 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 the yeast convert various things in the grapes. And so the, uh, a lot of the flavor that we find in the wine is based on the composition of the grapes at harvest. And that varies depending on where the grapes grow. So that's one of the reasons why we'll discuss later that the site where the grapes grow is very important because the, their development during ripening um, leads to certain composition of the grapes. And then the yeast take that to the next step and make, make wine out of it. Um, so, the, <coughs> um, so we have the, the flavors then that are coming from the fermentation. Like I said, um, uh, fruity aromas and, and for the chemists out there, a lot of those are esters. And there's also some terpenes depending on the, the type of grapes. Um, and then the, the tastes, uh, like the, the, the acidity really is, is found in the grapes themselves. And the, 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 uh, the, the fermentation does modify that in some ways, uh, but you have to have that, that basic acidity is, is coming from, uh, from the grapes. Um, and as you mentioned, um, let's see. Uh, okay, now if we wanna make a sweet wine, um, <clears throat> In general, what you do is you're making a dessert style wine. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna start with extremely sweet grapes. And there's various tricks to getting those sweet. Uh, drying the grapes works, uh, freezing the grapes works. Uh, there's other ways, other, uh, other tricks you might say. But you start with grapes that are, um, well, okay. So your, your typical grape uh, when you harvest is about 25% sugar. If you're gonna make a dessert wine, you'll start with something that's maybe 40% sugar or even higher than that. Uh, so you start with a very high sugar concentration and then you run the fermentation and uh, usually the fermentation will either stop itself or you can step in and stop it directly. Uh, and the result is that you have leftover sugar and for something to be sweet, you need something around 10% sugar left over it. Uh, we're not very sensitive to sugar, so you need a lot of it for something to taste distinctly sweet. So port, for instance, is an example. And the way that's made is you, you run the fermentation usually for a couple of days, and uh, then you add alcohol. You add a lot of alcohol, uh, usually uh, brandy that you've gotten from the prior vintage. Um, and you add just this, this high, highly concentrated uh, brandy, uh, highly concentrated alcohol, and that stops the fermentation. And so you then have whatever sugar was left over when you added the alcohol um, is, was, is there permanently or, or, or you know, indefinitely. So <clears throat> then you, so are you doing that, you, you stop the fermentation and you end up with a sweet wine. And I think the other category I wanted to mention is the sparkling wine. Um, <clears throat> and that's, as I mentioned before, the fermentation produces alcohol, ethanol and carbon dioxide. So in sparkling wine, what you do is you, generally you, you ferment uh, the, the sugar that's in the grapes and you make a, a, a dry wine that's usually pretty high in acid and low in alcohol. Um, and then you add sugar, you add yeast, and you put it in a closed container, um, often a bottle, uh, a champagne bottle. And then the fermentation takes place in that closed container and it produces a little bit more alcohol and the carbonation, the carbon dioxide that makes the wine sparkling. Um, <clears throat> when you do that, then there's a little, you have, to, you have to use a few tricks to get the leftover yeast out so you can have a nice, clear, sparkling uh, wine. But that's the, the trick to making that. Um, so were there other wines you were interested in? I mean, I think we can maybe also um, uh, raise the point about sherry and some ports that are that are oxidized. Um, how does that uh, how does that get done? Well, sherry is a it's interesting. Both of those wines were developed actually by British merchants um, many, many years ago. Uh, and then those a lot of those wines then went to the went to London uh, to be sold. Um, sherry is. Um, essentially an oxidized wine where you start with grapes that don't have much flavor. And in fact, this is uh, a little trick, even you're, you're, you're starting with 
wine, which otherwise really wouldn't have much going for it. Um, and then you put it in barrels with a, a very special yeast that actually uses oxygen. And uh, for those of you who are chemists, you might understand this. You, it converts the ethanol to acetaldehyde, which is an oxidation step. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and that actually then um, imparts a distinctive flavor. And the other things happen as well. There's other molecules that are produced by that fermentation, special fermentation process. Um, and you end up with what you might call uh, an oxidized wine. And, it, it, and that is in fact, if you wanna know what does an oxidized wine smell like, get, get a bottle of sherry and smell that. That'll tell you right away. Um, but that's, that's made, I mean, it's made deliberately uh, for that flavor. Um, and you can also make sherry uh, chemically without the yeast. You basically can just put uh, wine into a tank and add some oxygen and warm it up and it'll get oxidized and it'll make the same product. Uh, not, it's not considered as good as the one that's made by the fermentation process. And then port um, is, uh, sometimes uh, aged for a very long period of time, which does lead to oxidation. So because port has a fairly high um, sugar and alcohol level, it's fairly stable on aging. So it can last for decades. Uh, and I have tasted ports, which are actually over a hundred years old. And, uh, they don't taste like the normal port, but uh, they're, they're pretty amazing. It's very interesting. You raised the point that these particular wines, like the sherry and the port, come from a particular area of the country and were developed for kind of business reasons. That raises the whole question about why does location matter for wine? And so um, this is a big question, but maybe you could introduce us to, to how location impacts wine. Well, you've all heard, I mean, if you have, know anything about wine, you've heard of certain areas where wines come from. And certainly in the U.S., the most famous is Napa Valley. Uh, but, you know, you've probably heard of Chianti, Burgundy, Bordeaux. Um, and, and, of course, there are many, many other places that are famous for their wine. And it's because that particular location, um, in that location, uh, the grapes that are grown there um, develop particular, uh, well, it's chemicals in the grapes, which then during fermentation produce wines, which are remarkable. So, <clears throat> um, so location where the grapes grow is important. And I think uh, you should be, uh, one thing you have to understand is it's not where the wine is made, it's where the grapes grow. And that can be, uh, so that can be different places that might be important. So for instance, um, in the United States, it's legally required that you list on the bottle the location where the wine was put in the bottle, okay? The bottling, location of the bottling plant. And not too surprisingly, there are um, a whole bunch of bottling plants in the town of Napa uh, because then the grapes may not come from there, but if you look carefully, you'll see that the word Napa is on the bottle and you might think, oh, this wine comes from Napa. What it means is it was bottled in a bottling plant in the town of Napa. So keep that in mind. Now, <clears throat> in, now the, as you might guess, there are hundreds of different special places where grapes grow. And wine experts, one of the things they get to learn is what all those names are and where they are and, and all that. Um, and, but obviously today we're not going to go over a list of hundreds of vineyards. So what I can say is that if you're evaluating wine and you're trying to figure out, you know, is this wine you know, interesting or not, you can tell by looking at the sort of the scale of the location where the wine comes from. So I have some pictures here. And the first one shows uh, a wine label where the wine comes uh, defined as coming from California. So I'm sure some of you out there have purchased a Charles Shaw wine from Trader Joe's. It's a famous brand. It's uh, colloquially called Tubac Chuck. Maybe you've heard of that expression. And these wines are made on a very large scale. 
And so the grapes come from many different locations uh, for any particular bottling. So all the grapes though come from California. So on the label here, it says, uh, this particular one is a 2008 California Merlot. So you know that the grapes came from California, but as you might guess for an inexpensive wine like this, the grapes are probably gonna come from a number of locations that'll differ from year to year. So when you see an appellation like this, that's California or maybe New York, you know that perhaps uh, this is not the most selective uh, wine in the world, okay? Now, <clears throat> to be a little bit more selective, um, my next picture shows a wine from Paso Robles, which is a, uh, I would say, a wine growing region in uh, California, okay? So this is not uh, a, an individual vineyard, but it's a region um, which is well known for a warm climate, which is very well suited to Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? So this company called J. Lohr produces or grows um, a large quantity of Cabernet Sauvignon fruit in this region uh, because it's well suited for this particular type of grape. So you might see, so other, uh, uh, other names like this would be something like Napa Valley or Sonoma Coast um, or, uh, trying to think of Horse Heaven Hills from Washington State. These are all Appalachian regions. So they're defined wine growing areas um, that have particular you know, climate and soils and they're suited for, generally suited for, uh, better suited for particular grapes. So when you see uh, an Appalachian name like Paso Robles, you know, okay, well then they, hopefully they're growing and the wine you're buying is, has, made from grapes suited for that particular region. Now the most selective uh, label is the next one I'm gonna show you, which is, def is defined by a particular vineyard. So <clears throat> um, this is, uh, uh, Dave Ramey makes um, a number of different wines. Um, and this one here is a, that calls out a specific vineyard in Napa Valley. Okay, so he has two declarations on there where the grapes come from. One is Napa Valley, which I'm sure that's on there because uh, he wants, you know, he wants everyone to know that it comes from this famous region. But then he further declares on there a particular vineyard name, in this case, Jericho Canyon. So now this uh, giving a vineyard name doesn't guarantee that the wine is better, but at least you know that the grapes are coming from a very specific location. And presumably when they're making this declaration, they're saying this because it is ideally suited for this particular type of wine, okay? So in terms of you know, looking at bottles in the market, um, by, by <clears throat> identifying whether the, the grapes are coming from a, a very wide region like California, like a state or a particular wine growing area, or a particular vineyard gives you some um, information on perhaps uh, the, you might think the quality level, although the term quality is really loaded term. So I'm not gonna, not gonna guarantee that it's better if it has a vineyard name on it. So to follow up on that a little bit, um, is there, does, I guess, does the place impact the quality on average and what, factors in the place impact the quality? So the, yes, um, really the biggest factor is climate. Um, and of course, climate change is kind of scary for winemakers, um, but it has to do with the amount of heat the, that the vineyard experiences through the growing season. And we have scales for measuring this called degree days. It's going to tell you like if this vineyard is warmer than that one by measuring degree days. Um, and then of course, uh, water availability is important. And right now California's experience in a big drought. So that has impacted our yield. In fact, the yields are down out here uh, because the vines are suffering from lack of water. Um, so it's the, the climate is the most important factor um, and then the soil of the site has an impact. It's a secondary uh, effect 
Uh, it has to do with largely the amount of water retained in the soil and how it's retained and so on. Um, but the climate is the most important. And then I'd have to say the, the, the next factor is really the people there, right? Because to get, um, especially for higher quality fruit, you really have to farm the site properly, meaning you have to do things like pruning and other uh, vine management. So vines are, you know, are very uh, flexible. You can get them to grow any way you want, really. Um, but to get the best quality, you have to do a number of things. So you have to control the, the, low, the uh, crop yield, so the amount of grape on the vine. And then one of the things that's very important is the amount of sunlight that gets on the fruit. So managing, so you have to do pruning to manage the, the yield of the vine, and then you have to go back and do all sorts of manipulations. So that it's very important that people who actually do this have to be highly skilled to produce a very high quality wine. Now for the you know, lesser expensive wines, there's much less, um, I'll say, effort in the vineyard. Uh, partly because you just simply can't afford it. Um, sending a crew into a vineyard to do a leaf pulling run costs a lot of money. So you're not going to do that if you're selling uh, two buck chuck, for instance. You just simply can't afford that kind of uh, labor effort. But to follow up on, on, on uh, the location, you'll see that expensive wines tend to come from sort of rocky areas with hills and the cheaper ones come from like, you know, rich Central Valley areas. So from what you just said, it sounds like the best thing to do would be to give grapes lots of water and give them really rich soil. But um, is, is, is I, uh, that's not, you know, if you could kind of no. clarify that a little bit. Yeah, no, no, actually uh, uh, difficult, uh, growing sites are great for high quality. So, I mean, one way to think of this is you want the vines to struggle. And you hear this often in uh, wine literature that, you know, our, our site is really difficult and our vines really have to struggle to produce their fruit. And, and that, is a, that's, that is a fact. I mean, if you have a rocky hillside site and just enough water for the grapes to survive, they do produce uh, really intensely flavored fruit. Um, sometimes it can be so tannic that it's hard to consume. Um, whereas if you grow grapes in a very rich soil with lots of water, they tend to produce a lot of fruit, but it's almost like the fruit is spreading out all the flavor that it would have put into the, you know, like two bunches, it puts it into 20 bunches of fruit, so you have this huge amount of fruit, lots of sugar, and so you can make a lot of wine with that, but the flavor content is going to be less. So very rich uh, farming sites are good for high production vineyards, but not good for high quality vineyards. So maybe with that, we can actually shift to the cost versus quality question. Okay, this is something that a lot of people in the grocery store struggle with when they are trying to come home for something with a nice dinner and they're faced with all of this array of things to choose from. Yeah, oh boy. Um, well, you know, I think it's certainly possible to enjoy wine at any price point. You know, it, it, it's really not necessary to spend a whole lot of money for um, to, to get a good wine. You, you can enjoy $10 wine, uh, maybe $2 wine is a bit of a stretch. Um, but, um, you know, $10 wine, uh, you can actually, you, know, you can get very good wine. Um, <clears throat> now, as the price goes up, in general, uh, quality goes up, but you know, there's so many exceptions. It's, I, I, I'm very reluctant to tell people you should spend more money if you want a good wine. Um, but obviously there are, you can get better tasting wine uh, and, and some of them are quite expensive. Um, I've asked our students, these are the winemaking students here who are very price conscious and uh, they follow the market very closely. And I've asked them over the years, you know, uh, how much money, well, what's the, the, I guess the question is, how high, uh, at, what, at what price point does quality and price disconnect? 
right? So, and, and, and so uh, several years ago, students were telling me, well, at $50, you know, you know, you could get a better, if you, if you paid more money up to $50, you get a better wine. And then above that, it wasn't clear. You know, you're paying for other things besides quality in the bottle. You're paying for reputation or scarcity or something like that. And recently, uh, students told me that now that's $150. So if you, if you buy $150 wine, you're probably getting something, you're probably getting what you're paying for. But if you pay $500, it's hard to say. Now, I don't buy wines at that price point, so I couldn't tell you <laughs> how accurate their, their perception is. But I think I would say that in the business, there is a perception that price does or quality does go up with price um, to some point and then you're you're paying for scarcity and, and other things as well and there's certainly uh, plenty of wines above 150 dollars here in california um, now the other thing i wanted to mention is that you know i guess occasionally you end up I, i've had the experience of having a really exceptional wine and usually that's not predictable, unfortunately. I, I can't tell you, go and buy this wine and it'll be fabulous. Um, uh, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, my son was home and, uh, and we wanted to have a special bottle and we went through the, my closet. <laughs> I don't have a wine cellar, I have a wine closet. And, uh, and I found a bottle there that was from 1988, which was important because I, I didn't even know I had it. I forgot, I'd forgotten. Somebody had given it to me. It was far and away the oldest bottle in my wine closet. And what was very important was that this is my son's birth year. So I had to pull that bottle out. Now, that, that's an old bottle. It was 30, he's 34. So it's a 34 year old bottle of wine. And I thought, oh boy, this, this is tricky. It may not be drinkable. You know, it's it's at, at age to the point where it could be old and oxidized and not really enjoyable even. But anyway, we got it out and got a, a backup wine <laughs> and we opened it and it was stunning. It was just amazing. And so, you know, you, you sometimes encounter these fantastic bottles of wine, but I'm afraid to say that most often when that happens, it's just dumb luck. It's, it's not like you can go out, I can tell you, go and buy this wine and you'll have a truly amazing experience. Clearly, I mean, if you, if you get a, you know, if you're like Pinot Noir and you go and spend $100 on a Pinot Noir, it'll probably be very good. Um, whether or not it transports you to the next dimension, I, I can't predict that. So actually a couple of things that we could add in here for those of you who are just looking for a nice wine to go with dinner. Uh, um, there, there are a number of options because it is so overwhelming to try to figure out what is good to drink. Um, often you might have a local wine shop um, and, and the person who purveys that, uh, uh, the purveyor of, of wine of the wine shop may be able to help you. Or if you don't have a local wine shop, you might be next to certain big box stores. Okay. The wine that I have here came from, I, I guess we've We've already been we've already named Trader Joe's. I was going to say Costco actually tends to do a pretty good job of bringing in wine from many different areas of the world. So what I have here is uh, from uh, Portugal, and it was I think less than ten dollars, and is quite a nice bottle of wine to drink. So so if you can take advantage of other people whose job it is to taste lots of different things, um, then that can be a very good way to get um, tasty and inexpensive bottles of wine. So, so since you mentioned oxidation, um, what sorts of problems or faults should drinkers be aware of? Well, today I think there are two issues that um, I guess we would encounter uh, fairly, well, occasionally, uh, not, not too often. Um, the, the biggest one that I think everyone should be aware of is the, the issue of corked wine. So that's when uh, we have a taint in the wine from the cork. Now it turns out there are other sources for this taint, but mostly uh, if, if you encounter this, it's actually caused by the cork itself. Now the incidence for this is declining for a number of reasons. The cork producers have figured out how to limit this. So the, the number of tainted bottles is much lower than it used to be many years ago. 
Um, and the other thing is that actually, if you if the winemaker wants to spend the money, they can get every single cork analyzed, and so they basically remove any cork that is has this problem. Um, now, this is the basis for returning a bottle if you're in a restaurant. So if you order a bottle of wine and it's cork tainted, then you're free to reject the bottle. This is important. I mean, you. You're not supposed to turn down a bottle because you just didn't like it. <laughs> if it's tainted though, and now the, what does this smell like? Well, the best descriptor is wet cardboard. It turns out wet cardboard or cardboard uh, often has this chemical, it's called TCA, trichloranosol, in it. And if you give it gets wet, it sort of releases some of this smell. Um, <clears throat> and so if you're looking for it, like, what is, what am I supposed to be smelling for? If you have like some old cardboard lying around, it gets wet. That is the smell of TCA, trichloranosol. And it's, it's quite problematic from a taint perspective because we are super, super sensitive to it. Um, literally, if a wine contains five parts per trillion, you can smell. Um, now, you should also realize that for things like this, every person has a different threshold. So some people can smell it at two parts per trillion and other people have trouble smelling it at 10 parts, 10 parts per trillion. Um, but anyway, that is, that's an important taint that you want to uh, recognize. And if it's, if, if the wine has got that problem, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to order it or you don't want to drink it. I'll jump in one other thing here. There, there have been some studies on how this chemical affects your taste. And so you may think, oh, well, maybe it's corked, but this is a nice dinner and I don't want to, you know, embarrass anybody. I'll just drink it. The problem is, is that this chemical actually binds your taste buds and interferes with your ability to taste other things as well. So it isn't, it, it's actually common. You're like, hmm, I think I smell this. I'm not sure. The more you drink it, the more you're like, you know, there's something off with this bottle of wine. And it really is worth um, calling over the sommelier and saying, you know, I, this is off because it'll interfere with the whole rest of your nice dinner. Hmm. Now, if you, I, I can say if you get a cork bottle at home, you can try to rescue it. So it turns out that this chemical is very lipophilic, meaning that it will bind to um, uh, nonpolar surfaces. So you can actually take the wine, put it into a bowl, and then take a big sheet of, of uh, plastic wrap and crumple it up and put it and stir it around in the bowl for 10, 15 minutes. And it will in fact decrease the amount of cork taint. It also removes some other flavors, but um, if there's just a little bit there and, you're, and, and you wanna try to recover it, that, that actually works pretty well. Well, that's very cool. I did not know that. So, so um, go ahead. Yeah, oxidation, did you wanna yeah. ask about that? Yeah. So. So oxidation is, um, <clears throat> uh, so if, you, if you're not sure what oxidation smells like, get yourself a bottle of sherry. You can get some really cheap these days. You look on the bottom shelf at the grocery store, usually about three, $4 a bottle. Um, so, and this can happen in the bottle. This usually happens after a bottle of wine is opened. So this is typically a, not a problem with a freshly opened bottle, but with a bottle that's been sitting around at a restaurant. So if you're ordering by the glass, this, is, this can be an issue. For instance, if um, you're there on a Tuesday night and you've ordered a bottle, a glass of something that has been sitting there since Saturday, it may be a little bit oxidized. Um, and so that's where, again, you can say, well, to me, this, uh, this nice white wine has a little bit of a sherry-like aroma. Perhaps you have a fresh bottle available. Okay, very interesting. So, so since um, uh, you were talking about how cork uh, can cause problems through this introduction of this trichloroanisol, this is a good transition to talk a little bit about different types of closures. So, for example, this bottle of wine I have here has a screw cap. Uh, many other types, you know, the kind of classic thing is a cork. Um, people often have the perception that screw caps are somehow bad because it's a mark of a cheap wine. So, could you comment on screw caps? Yes, unfortunately, poor screw caps have been uh, tainted with that reputation. But in fact, technically, they're they're really fine as a as a closure. Um, so, in fact, in uh, I would say in New Zealand, 
no, almost every bottle is sealed with a screw cap these days. So, so screw cap is perfectly functional. Um, and they're in the market, there's maybe three or four different kinds of closures you will encounter. One is, of course, a natural cork. Um, and then there's a technical cork where they take cork and grind it up. And often, actually, this is a, a way to get rid of uh, the cork taint, the TCA. Um, you, can, you can actually process that to remove TCA, and then you glue it back together. And those corks are quite popular right now. They're, I think they're growing as, in terms of market share. And then there's uh, synthetic corks, basically made of plastic. Um, and those are, you know, probably about 20% of the market right now. They, they used to have more. They've been sort of shrinking. Um, and then there's screw caps, which again are growing as well. Now, the key thing is that the, uh, the performance criteria is how much oxygen goes through the closure as the wine is sitting there in the bottle. And it turns out, that typical screw caps, there's some exceptions, and natural cork and synthetic cork all perform close to the same amount. The amount of oxygen going through, it varies by about 20 or 30%. It doesn't vary by a factor of 10 or anything like that. Now, so, so for short term, meaning a couple of years, your typical, you know, buy the wine at the store and take it home and drink it, it really, it really have to say it doesn't matter. Um, and from a performance perspective, they'll all be fine. Um, the advantage of the screw cap is they're easy to get off. And you can be absolutely sure there's not gonna be any cork tape. Um, I, I enjoy getting bottles with screw caps on them because I don't have to get a cork screw out. Um, now for long aging, if you're gonna keep a bottle for you know, more than five years, uh, natural cork is really the best option. And the reason is that natural cork actually changes its behavior over time and lets in less oxygen so that when a wine is you know, 10 or 20 years old, it's actually getting a very little oxygen through that closure. A synthetic cork doesn't change its behavior. Uh, so synthetic corks are really not suited for long-term aging. Now, screw caps are really tricky because there's two or three flavors of screw caps and you have no idea when you buy a bottle which flavor you're getting. There's a style of screw cap that lets in almost no oxygen. It's amazingly tight. And that would be perfectly suited for long-term aging. Um, but um, you can't tell what you're getting. You know, you can't tell that from looking at the bottom. So um, now the other caveat is that if you do get one with that kind of screw cap, it will age differently because the aging, you say the, we call it the aging trajectory of wine, is, you know, is affected by the amount of oxygen coming in the bottle. So if you have one of those screw caps that let in almost no oxygen, the wine ages very differently. Um, it can be great, um, or it can be, you know, not so great, but it will not be, uh, not taste normal if you know, like what a 10 year old wine is supposed to taste like, it will not taste like that. So it's very interesting. But I mean, for your typical, you know, let's go uh, to the store and get some wine, the closure really is not uh, important unless you plan to age the bottle. So I think with that, maybe what we can start transitioning to some of the audience questions, because there is one question that directly feeds in there. Um, I, you know, how do you know whether a wine should be aged or not? You know, when is the good time to drink it? Okay, most wines in the market are meant to be consumed this year. Uh, it's really a small fraction of relatively expensive wines that are designed for long-term aging. And those are, uh, with white wines, it's a very specialized number of them. Uh, essentially, you have to have, well, I'm not even going to get into that because that it gets a little too tricky. But for, for red wines, for aging, if you want a wine to age, say, for more than five years, you want something that has a fairly high level of tannin. And I'm not going to go into the chemistry of that, but you know, if you're tasting the wine and it has um, that astringency, that strong astringency to it, um, that will actually dissipate over time. So a wine that's meant, a red wine that's meant for long aging is actually not ideal. Then of course they'll tell you you can drink it anytime you want. Of course you can. Um, but really a wine that's meant for long aging has a high level of tannin 
And that makes it a little, I would say, less pleasant to consume when it's young because it's just too astringent. But as it ages, then that astringency dissipates, other things happen. And then, then so that, that wine is, is designed to survive essentially oxidation. So the, the tannin in there is a buffer against oxidation. And that's what allows it to survive uh, that long aging period. Because every year, a little bit of oxygen comes into the bottle through the cork. And, um, you know, it, it reacts with the tannin and, and that actually is what causes the tannin to change. Um, but without that tannin up front, then the wine, you know, will sort of peter out after a few years. So, so to follow up on that, though, um, it, it's kind of sounded like that wine always kind of uh, goes downhill, except that, you know, the tannins, you're getting rid of something bad. Uh, do you get something good through aging, too? Oh, yes, yes. So, so those wines that are meant for aging are actually getting better every year. Well, um, I would say for that type of wine, they're probably best between 10 and 20 years of age. And at, at eventually they'll, they'll get so oxidized that they start to lose. Like I mentioned that 88, you know, I was, I really thought that wine was going to be toast, right? But it had survived somehow. Um, 88 was maybe just a particularly good year or I got lucky. I don't know. Um, but um, a lot of the wines that are made, you know, for ready consumption, are really not designed um, to, to survive more than a few years, right? And the red wines will last longer, but you know, even um, high quality white wines, um, unless they're very specifically made for aging. Uh, I, I remember talking to this winemaker who was, we were making, we were doing an experiment with Sauvignon Blanc. And uh, this was not cheap Sauvignon Blanc. I, I can't remember what they were selling it for, but I'm sure it was north of $50, which is, very expensive. And um, she was saying she did not want the wine on the shelf after two years. That in her mind, after two years, she wanted that bottle consumed. Um, so, so, you know, <clears throat> there, like I said, there are a few exceptions, but generally speaking, white wine um, will not survive a long time. Um, you know, so two or three years is, is a sort of, you're pushing it. And once you get you know, inexpensive white wines that are five years old or older, I can tell you they're not going to be at their best. So I'll pick up one question here. Somebody asked, uh, how does an individual's unique biology, such as taste buds and biochemistry, affect their interpretation of our preference for taste and aroma? And as a biochemist who's also a biologist, I, I've, I've done some sort of studying into this. And I think the answer is it has an immense effect on it because everybody is going to have um, uh, their own set of um, sensory abilities. And some people are much more sensitive to certain things than others. You already heard about the, the TCA. Some people can really taste it and other people are, are smell it and other people can't. And so that's going to affect both your ability to detect something and and your ability to enjoy it. So for example, turns out, you know, truffles are something that a lot of people really like. I can't particularly taste them. Um, so, you know, no use spending that on me. It's not going to be something I'll enjoy, but other people love it. My husband, for example, really likes truffles. So um, I, I think the answer is that um, you need to define what you enjoy drinking. And that also goes back to the taste part, right? Um, the right wine is the one that you enjoy and a good one is the one that you enjoy. And different people are going to be able to taste and smell different things in wine. Now, having said that, there's also a learned component though. The people that um, can, you know, they'll drink something and say, oh, I taste, you know, dark cherries and a different wine might have leather in it. You say, well, how could there be leather in it? What there, th there isn't actually leather, as you heard, but what there are are chemicals that have aromas um, that are similar to uh, what comes off of leather. And uh, it can be very hard to put a name
attuned to a particular smell. Um, and, and that can take real learning. And so if you go to some winery visits, you'll actually have the chance to smell different things and then find out what it is. That's a lot of fun to try to do that. And it can be surprisingly, it's like, oh, I recognize that, but I don't know what it is. And the explanation given for why that's so hard is smell is in a very kind of reptilian ancient part of your brain and words are, uh, you know, it, these, these parts aren't well connected. So there is a learned component unambiguously, um, and, and but there is also um, a genetically different component. And I think that perfect pitch is, is actually not a bad analogy. Some people are quite tone deaf. They can't tell differences in pitch uh, really at all. My mother, you could play two keys on a keyboard. She can't tell you which one's higher. Other people can tell the pitches, but not cannot name like an A440. And then there are people with perfect pitch who can tell it exactly. And learning can shift you back and forth, but there's some fundamental biology there. Okay, sorry, I'm going on too long about that because I get excited about it. But um, so some other questions here, how do ratings or awards uh, relate to the quality of wines? Oh boy. <laughs> um, okay. So the short answer is that there's um, styles or, or maybe there's style, popular styles of wine, okay? And, and it's just like, you know, fads in clothing and whatever. And what you find is that particular companies or people like a particular style or like particular flavor profiles, and they rate those more highly than others. Um, but styles change. So, for instance, with Zinfandel, for many years, very high alcohol uh, Zinfandels were really popular, and now they're not, right? So, 10 years ago, those wines were highly rated. Now they're not highly rated. So, the, the ratings uh, do tell you at, at least whether somebody is achieving a, uh, a style of wine which is popular in the market right now, but it's not. It's never an absolute scale, and that's because, you know, we we like different things and and so on. So, it it's a helpful guide sometimes, but not always. Sorry about to be so ambiguous. Well, you know, it is it is a a, a useful. Uh thing to, to to consider because we're bombarded with so many of these uh these different ratings but I, and sometimes it can be as you said helpful when you're when you're overwhelmed by trying to figure out what to choose um i'm being uh, kind of poked that it's time to wrap up here um and so before uh we sign up I need to, to do a, a, a both uh, thank all of you, the audience for joining us and give you a couple of reminders. Okay, so first there's a whole series of questions we weren't able to get to. And some of these are going to be addressed in later sessions. So for example, there were a number of questions about wine making and that's going to be addressed um, in, in one of the two uh, the next sessions. Um, there were also some questions about business um, and that's going to be addressed in a later session. So please go ahead ahead and, and, and sign in for, to hear more about those. In addition, we have um, some videos and additional resources on Think in D, in D. So please review these if you'd like to dive in further to today's topics. Uh, of special note, uh, the Notre Dame Family Wine Program has provided some printables that can help you have your own tasting at home. These include a tasting placemat and a graphic that can take you through some of the steps we uh, discussed today. In addition, uh, Notre Dame sommelier uh, Greg Tutter, uh, Greg Tucker shares a brief three minute video on how to taste wine that'll follow up on some of what you heard from Andy today. Um, and then to go more specifically in the in the dates, so the next date for in this session is going to be November 17th, uh, where there will be a launching of the science and business of spirits uh, with our colleague uh, Ken Kuno um, from Notre Dame College of Science. Um, and then he'll be joined by Aran uh, Runabom um, from the class of 1996, who is also a faculty member um, at the Robert Mondavi Institute at UC Davis. Um, and finally, please do feel uh, free to share this series with your friends. It's open to the public and we are accepting registrations throughout the entire program um, and each meeting um, can stand alone. So um, please uh, um, uh, join us in those, those future sessions and uh, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, very much a deep thank you to Andy Waterhouse for, uh, for this session. So until next time, uh, we will sign, sign off for now. Thank you, Holly. <laughs>